Hey everyone, this is Raptor Chatter. We're going to be looking at what happened in January 2024 in paleontology. And there's a whole lot that happened actually, so let's get into it. Starting with the first paper, it's going to be very important for future papers. And that's because it was mostly looking at data, and specifically data in the context of the Paleobiological Database, or PBDB which has been a really useful tool in more recent years because, hey, it's a single place where you can find a whole bunch of data. The problem is people just cite that data and not the original articles where that data was written in. The main issue with this is it doesn't cite the original research, and in this kind of modern day world that we have with academia, a lot of publishers who put something out into the world need it to be cited so they can show their institution, look, I provide value. It's this publish or perish kind of mentality. And having everything in one place is great, but we really need to be considerate about citing all of those sources that are put into that database and not just the database itself. Moving into papers more directly on fossil animals and how they reacted to the world, there was a paper on what happened to the Chicxulub crater. And as far as what I mean by that is what happened and the after effects of that impact. And what they actually found is there would have been a lot less CO2 release than previously thought, meaning that essentially that would have helped intensify the nuclear or impact winter that would have occurred by the release of all of the other gases, in particular gases containing sulfur, which would have blocked out a lot of the sun's rays. CO2 could have potentially at least kind of provided a slightly warmer type of environment because it would have held in the rays that did get through. But since there wasn't as much CO2 that got through, seems like it was just a very cold time for at least a few years after that impact. I'd love to go into all the details and graphs on this, but this is all a bunch of geochemistry and it would take at least 10 to 15 minutes to explain the basics and a little bit more to explain what specifically they did. And huge shout out to Mary Reed, wonderful geochemist who taught me, but that's not what I'm here for. I'm here more about the consequences for it. As for other extinctions, the Permian Triassic was the worst with up to 90% of life in the oceans dying out and 75% of life on land. And one of those groups that's been proposed as dying out on land is the Gorgonopsids, which were large, related to mammals, and top predators in their environments. A few fossils from what's been potentially the Triassic of the Karoo Basin has been the leading evidence for potentially them actually surviving this extinction, at least for a time. And what this paper was able to do is look at those three separate fossils and go, hey, two of these aren't from the Triassic, they're from the Permian. And then also look at a bunch of fossils that were found with the last one and go, these may have just been poorly labeled and not labeled correctly, meaning that essentially, as far as we can tell, no, they did all die out at the Permian Triassic extinction. I still wouldn't be shocked if a few lived maybe even a million years afterwards because it was a long extinction interval that extended into the Triassic, but whether or not that is the case, we're going to have to find out later. Around that same extinction, there was a look at the fossil of Diathronathus brumai, which is a pretty well-known fossil of something related to the mammals that lived after that extinction. But unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of really intense work on it up until now when researchers were able to throw them into a CT scanner and actually look at all the fossils. And what they were able to find is a number of different things. Actually, the first thing they found is that based on the skull morphology, it was probably only been known from juvenile individuals and that those juveniles probably aren't related to any of the larger mammaliforms or things related to mammals that we do find in the Triassic, also in South Africa. They also found that based on the shape of the olecranon process on the ulna, one of the arm bones, the lower arm bone specifically, it was probably engaging in scratch digging, and potentially even digging burrows that way, which could lead potentially to the miniaturization of mammaliforms during the later Triassic and then throughout the rest of the Mesozoic. On that note, the mammals are thought of, often at least, as the tiny survivors of the dinosaurs, and that necessarily wasn't written in stone. A new study on many synapsids that lived during the Triassic has shown that some were still able to get to fairly large sizes. This includes things like Exeratodon, which could get over 131 kilograms or over 300 pounds. It was a large predator in its environment. And it seems like the common ancestor of it and the other smaller mammals that actually did survive to the end of the Triassic and then throughout the Mesozoic was actually still moderately sized. Again, it wasn't predestined for all of the mammals and mammaliforms to end up super small throughout the Mesozoic. They were still competing for ego space even with fairly large predators. Staying in the Triassic, previously we've done a video on Pantydraco, an odd dinosaur that comes from fissure fills in southwest England and parts of Wales. The problem is these have often been considered parts of the very, very late Cretaceous rock sequence that occurs in parts of England and Wales, 
and not as much in Scotland because those rocks are mostly older. This paper was looking at the age of those fissure fills and found, hey, they could potentially be as much as 30 million years older than what we thought, which would place them in the Carnian Pluvial episode when large amounts of rain were being formed because of large amounts of volcanism occurring on the other side of the world in what would become the northwest of the United States and parts of Canada. Without spoiling my video on Panty Draco, it was thought to be an early branching but long surviving member of its group. And said so it seems like it was an early branching member of its group, just period of end. It didn't really live 30 million years without the influences of these other ecosystems that were evolving throughout the later part of the Triassic. Instead, it just was there at the beginning of the late Triassic, 30 million years earlier, around 230 million years ago total, and just living its life. That said, there was another paper that looked at some of these fissure fills and went, hey, Pachystrophius is in some of these, and that's only known from the very, very late Triassic. So again, these first ones from the first paper were pushed back 30 million years, and this second paper is saying, no, there's not that 30 million year difference. So what that suggests to me is potentially there's fissure fills of many, many different ages present in this environment, and when we're looking at some of these fissure fills in parts of, again, Southwest England and parts of Wales, we need to take them on a case-by-case -case basis, not necessarily just prescribe them all to a single time age. Previous studies on the age of sauropod bones coming from the Sichuan Basin in China have suggested that they are potentially around 160 million years old, and that was based on calcite and differences in how calcite forms. However, now they looked at zircons, and they were able to look at those, use uranium lead dating on those, and go, Hey, yeah, these also suggest about 160, maybe 165 million years old. This is really interesting because these sauropod fossils coming from this fauna in China are actually slightly different and older than the faunas that we see in places like North America where there's a lot of sauropods, example being the Morrison Formation. So what this potentially suggests is that this part of South China was really important for the early sauropod diversity, and then they were able to diversify and spread across the rest of the globe before Pangaea fully broke up. That doesn't mean all of the sauropods, though, left China. There were some that stayed there even into the Cretaceous, such as Gandhi Titan Cavocadatus. It would have been a large titanosaur and would have lived in parts of East Asia, and combined with other fossils coming from the late Cretaceous of East Asia, it does suggest that potentially there was just a totally unknown lineage of large sauropods living in East Asia in the late Cretaceous. It may also just be really hard to find some of those fossils because of modern day or almost modern day mountain building events, such as the rise of the Himalayas. The fossils of animals like the Gandhi Titan may have actually been mostly buried by those mountain building events, and those fossils could still exist, but maybe 500 meters underneath Earth's surface. It's really hard to find them. Alternatively, they could just be covered in glaciers in the Himalayas. It depends on where exactly the faults formed, but Regardless, the point is there might be a whole different lineage of sauropods that lived in the late Cretaceous in Asia that, again, we just don't really fully understand yet. Staying in China, we also have a new stegosaur named from China, and it's actually from the early part of the Cretaceous, although late in the early part of the Cretaceous, making it potentially one of the last stegosaurs to have lived. And I say this because it seems like stegosaurs mostly went extinct by the middle of the Cretaceous. So, again, this is one of the very late hangers-on. Yanbeilong ultimus is this new one, and it was found to be very closely related to both Stegosaurus, which is from North America, and Wuherosaurus, which has actually been considered Stegosaurus sometimes, although most people consider it its own genus. This is really interesting because again, Stegosaurus, North American, Wuherosaurus is from Asia. Meanwhile, we have multiple lineages of things that aren't closely related to each other in the Stegosaurs that are living both in the Morrison Formation. So what we really need to do, especially when you look at the rest of this tree and you understand the biogeography that's going on here, is hopefully get some really good stegosaur fossils, because most of them are pretty incomplete, and if we can get some better ones, we might be able to understand what's happening. Because it seems like we have a bunch of different groups, but that are showing up all over the world at the same time. So there's not really one kind of easy, oh, clearly this group just moved to North America, and this group moved into parts of Africa, and this part stayed in Asia. No, they all went all over the place, and we have no idea why or how. On the subject of Werhosaurus, another paper actually found another Stegosaur, and in this one they considered Werhosaurus to be the same as Stegosaurus, at least as far as the genus is concerned. The problem is, 
This new animal that they also found, also coming from China, is in between Werhosaurus, or at least that species if it is Stegosaurus, and the Stegosaurus coming from North America, Stegosaurus stenops. This one still lived in the early Cretaceous, and later than when Stegosaurus, at least in North America, lived during the late Jurassic. Potentially what's going on here is again just very complex biogeography that we don't fully understand yet, be great to have a better idea of it, but this one's really interesting because the environment that it was found in, it was found alongside an ankylosaur. And this is interesting because the ankylosaurs are very closely related to the stegosaurs, potentially just evolved directly out of them, but also potentially it seems like the ankylosaurs may have just outcompeted the stegosaurs and they could have been the cause of the demise of the stegosaurs. They were just able to fill those niches better than stegosaurs could. Again, really weird to see them living alongside one another, but also the taxonomy in stegosaurs is horrible. Hopefully we get some better tools to really understand that, and I know of at least some from SVP that could be really useful here. Staying in China but moving to the Triassic with things that aren't dinosaurs, we're looking at Keanosuchus, which was actually a poposaurid, a type of pseudosuchian, so on the crocodile line of reptiles as opposed to the dinosaur line of reptiles. This thing's really interesting because it's been considered as basically the only aquatic member of its group, Poposauridae, and because this paper was actually looking to see, hey, was it aquatic? And there's a wonderful new fossil they found that actually really helps to show this, that they had suddenly so much more data to work from because they had a better fossil of it. And they were able to look at it in better detail and go, yeah, this thing would have been worse in the water than modern day crocodiles. So really not semi-aquatic the way it was suggested and really helps us to understand that no, it was probably pretty similar to other poposaurids, including things like Poposaurus, but also Arizonosaurus. Staying in crocodilians, there was also a look at a new crocodilian coming from Thailand, Varanosuchus sakanakanensis, which is a new atoposaurid crocodilian. The atoposaurs were crocodilians that were fairly close to modern crocodilians, and this new fossil is able to illuminate that a little bit. And it really helps to show that the atoposaurs would have been closely related to the group Paraalligatoridae, which isn't modern alligators. In fact, it's not that closely related. Instead, these two branches form a single branch at their root that is actually the sister group to modern crocodilians. So when we're looking at the early evolution of modern day crocodilians, this is a really important group to consider. And with this fossil, we helped understand a little bit about their biogeography and potentially where some of them were able to survive, where then later other groups were able to migrate into those environments and eventually force out things like the atoposaurs. It's still a lot of research that needs to be done, but it's a new species. It's coming from Thailand, a place that hasn't really had a lot of historically strong paleontology, and hopefully we'll get more from there in the future. Ophiasusuchus pimogonectes is a new crocodilomorph coming from Portugal, and it dates to the late Jurassic. This organism is really important for understanding the very, very early evolution of crocodilians, not just modern crocodilians, because it seems like it's one of the first organisms to actually shift from being a North American crocodilian into being a European crocodilian, because there were a lot of European crocodilians during the Mesozoic. I will also say it really helps to support the idea that Iberia was doing something really, really weird during the Mesozoic, especially as the break of Pangaea occurred. And that's because when you think about modern day Iberia, it's separated from the rest of Europe by the Pyrenees, which means it was on its own plate and had to run into parts of France to build those mountains. That also means potentially during the Mesozoic, it was somewhere more in between parts of Europe, but also parts of North America potentially with land bridges connecting the two and allowing migration of different faunas between the two continents. And that makes a lot of sense. We find a lot of things similar to North America in parts of Spain and Portugal, but also things that are really similar to what we find in Europe. Potentially, this was really the gateway that allowed many of these dinosaurs and other organisms, including crocodilians, to migrate across the world. And jumping to the Cretaceous, and specifically the early part of the late Cretaceous, we have the last Rabacosaurid, which was a very successful group of sauropods. They were around for millions of years. They were some of the first to diversify and did really well, up until they didn't. And that seems to be because in South America, at least, the environments changed to be mostly Titanosauriform dominated. The Rabacosaurs, though, were, again, still successful, and this new one seems to be one of the last of them. Cytosaura mare is this new fossil, and it's at least somewhat complete. However, the more important thing is the phylogeny finds it as one of the earliest branching of the Rabacosaurs, despite it being one of the last. This really does mean that we need to study their evolutionary history better, because potentially it is a late diverging one, because again, it's one of the last, 
or potentially again, it just split off earlier from all the other ones, which continued diversifying, and its little lineage just kept plugging along, doing what they were doing, mostly hanging around wetlands. Again, eventually they did die out, and that potentially has things to do with the climate more than titanosaurs, but there were some titanosaurs that eventually adopted the same body style, so it wasn't necessarily a failure that was entirely inherent upon just these robocosaurs. There could have been many other reasons that they went extinct. There was also a look at late Cretaceous dinosaur fossils from Bulgaria, and they weren't necessarily able to name the entire organism, but they were able to go, hey, this is a hadrosauroid, and it's around the same size as many of the other ones, which many of the other hadrosauroids from Europe at this time are small, and that's generally thought to be a case of insular dwarfism, where essentially when the animals got to islands, there were less resources, so evolution selected for the smaller ones, and then they kept getting smaller. And this animal from Bulgaria is about the same size, but what they did is cut open the bone and looked for LAGs, or lags. And these are lines of arrested growth, which show when the animal slowed down its growth. Based on these, you can actually get a sense to some degree of how old the organism may have been. Unfortunately, in this case, the lags were really, really hard to ID. And that's because there was so much new bone growth happening that this animal had to still be young. So it helps to show that not necessarily all of the islands that would have existed in this European archipelago were the same size. And not all of the organisms that exist in that archipelago had to get small. Some of them could still stay relatively large. It was just a matter of which particular island they ended up on and were able to evolve on. And some of them, including this new organism that wasn't able to be named again, seems like it may have been pretty similar size to other hadrosauroids. It's just the others that got trapped onto smaller islands that ended up smaller. One of the most famous cases of this from the very latest Cretaceous actually comes from Romania and specifically the Hatseg Basin. This basin has been great for finding things like Hatsegopteryx, giant pterosaurs that were probably the top predators in their environments because they could fly around and access all of the islands instead of just some of them. While we know that this is from the latest Cretaceous, no one's really done any studies to see how old these fossils might be. And so by looking through the various layers of rocks, they were able to find the oldest known layer of rocks there, find some zircons in it, and go, hey, this is potentially as old as the latest Campanian. And here's a figure for the Cretaceous. And you can see the Mastrictian as the final stage of the Cretaceous. Meanwhile, just before that, you have the Campanian. So all of these fossils were probably around and deposited between the latest part of the Campanian up until the very end extinction, where the giant rock came down, etc., etc., you know the rest of that. Staying in Europe, but jumping way back in time to the Carboniferous Permian boundary and to Germany, Stenocranio boldi is a new genus and species of an Areopid temnospondyl. The Areopids were a group of temnospondyl amphibians or amphibian-like organisms, which were pretty well established in the Permian, the most famous of which is Areops, and they got around the world pretty well. Ariops has been found as far as Arizona, where I'm at, and parts of Texas, but this new one, Stenocranio, has been found in Germany. The weirdest thing about this is there's a lot of other temnospondyls from other parts of Germany at this same time. So what this potentially means is Stenocranio was able to survive in kind of a very isolated environment, where other animals were starting to evolve and change more, it was more isolated. Now there's still going to be more studies to see what that means, was it isolated and so this is very similar to what their ancestral condition would have been and then the other ones were able to evolve because of things like ring species or other events, whole separate videos for that in the future, or potentially just was it able to evolve on its own because it was isolated. There's a lot of questions that you can ask, it would have potentially had a smaller population, there's, there's a ton to think about, but it is still very cool to find and hopefully we'll have some better answers for those in the future. There was also a study on the oldest reported amniote skin found anywhere in the world from a cave system that would have dated back to the Carboniferous. The problem with this is there's potentially also older amniote skin, and it also depends on what you define as an amniote. Amniotes are a group of animals which includes reptiles and mammals today, and this is really interesting because they were able to essentially move away from water for two main reasons. One being producing hard-shelled eggs, or at least mostly hard-shelled eggs, because some of them can still be kind of leathery, but also having skin that doesn't just leak water all the time. Sure, we can sweat, but it doesn't leak water the same way something like an amphibian would, where they would just dry up. The base of the amniotes, though, has been really, really hard to find, and so potentially there's older fossils of amniote skin preserved. It's just really hard to know for sure. The one thing I will say, though, is that this study is able to show some similarities to crocodile skin 
which makes at least some sense. They're hanging around the water still, but able to go out on land and not dry out. So potentially that is the ancestral amniote skin, and every other skin that came from that is just derivatives of that same basic concept. They've changed a lot in certain cases, definitely, but that may be our great, 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 great million times ancestors skin. Alien Acanthus malkowskii is a new species of placoderm, a group of early armored fish. And it's really weird because most of fish in this group normally have pretty basic skulls that are very well rounded and, you know, it looks like a fish. Alien Acanthus though, as you can see in this figure, doesn't do that. It had a very long and protrusive lower jaw, and it's still not exactly discussed what that was for. It's actually shown up in a lot of different fish at different times though, so clearly it was useful and it just helps to show that the early fish were already evolving a lot of diverse niches, and potentially using this to kind of dig through soil, or potentially also just whack other fish so that they could eat them more easily. And changing gears to something much closer to humans, we're actually looking at Giganopithecus, the giant ape that went extinct around 200,000 years ago. This study was trying to figure out why that might have been, and what they found is that around 200,000 years ago, there was a shift in the environment where it would have lived, and instead of being more consistent, it actually would have had a lot more seasonality. And unfortunately for Giganopithecus, it just couldn't handle that. Meanwhile, its close relatives, including things like the orangutan, were able to handle that change, as some of those ice ages set in and made the environments more seasonal. And for animals that humans would have interacted with, there was another one that was looked at, and this time it was a mammoth. Mammoth tusks grow pretty much throughout their lives, so by testing different parts of their tusks, you can see what isotopes are there. And if it's something like strontium, you can kind of tell where it would have been living based on those kinds of isotopes because they're very regional. The study only looked at one mammoth, but it was able to show that it moved over a thousand kilometers from where it would have probably been born in parts of central Canada, all the way into parts of Alaska. And it's really interesting because genetic testing of mammoths in this region of Alaska has shown there's multiple lineages and groups that actually would come to this area. It's also a place where there's a lot of archeological digs, which suggests the first Americans were definitely hunting mammoth and using that resource when it was available. There's also been a long-standing idea that people from the global south don't know anything about paleontology and et cetera, et cetera, colonialism, all that kind of stuff. This paper though was able to show that a massive spondylus bone, which is from a prosauropod, actually would have been found and taken into a camp by humans that were living there around 1100 years ago to maybe up to 1700 years ago. The important thing to note though is this is not during the time when paleontology was really being practiced. So indigenous Africans were able to find this fossil and then go, hey, this is weird and interesting. This tracks with other finds of other fossils. For example, many things like Jobaria and Giraffa Titan, sure, they were described by Europeans or people from the United States, but they were shown to those people by people who were already living in those regions, specifically in things like Niger with Jobaria. Moral of the story, Anyone can do paleontology, there's just certain material conditions that make it harder for certain groups to be able to do it. Another paper looked at 45 specimens of cave bear and looked at their isotopes to see what they were doing. What they found is they would have been basically eating an adult diet by one year after their birth. And that's really interesting because it suggests that they were still hanging with their mother, but also they were mostly eating plants. They weren't really the carnivores that we think of them as today. Instead, they were largely, again, browsing, eating plants, probably some amounts of protein with bugs and stuff, but not giant hunters. The Talara tar pits are in Peru, and they're really interesting because they're from about 15,000 years ago, and this paper was trying to figure out more what the local environment would have been like. Because you can have something like a jaguar in it, which is really cool, or even giant ground sloths, but those can move very long distances, so it doesn't tell you specifically about that environment. By looking at the various specimens of smaller animals they found, they were able to say the environment 15,000 years ago in this part of Peru would have been both wetter, but also a bit cooler, and that could have contributed to the higher biodiversity that we saw in those tar pits at that time, as opposed to now where it's a desert on a beach, basically. There's also a whimsically titled paper looking at the MOA and when it probably went extinct, and it took a whole bunch of different records of sightings, potentially up to 1993, which seems odd because most of the evidence suggests MOA went extinct pretty rapidly after humans found the island in the 1400s. They then compared this to sightings of the thylacine, or the Tasmanian tiger, to estimate better when it may have gone extinct based on those sightings. And what they found is, at best, maybe 1675 it could have survived to, but 
it's pretty likely that the moa definitely is extinct now. It's not surviving in any of the very small patches of forest that are left in New Zealand, and it's unfortunate because it would have been really cool to see a bird that was so large. On the subject of large birds, we have the terror birds, which not all of them were large. In fact, the first one is known from basically just one foot bone, the Tibo tarsus, and it's not really been studied that well, unfortunately. This study, though, did look at it and confirmed that, yes, it is actually from a forest racket or a terror bird, but also it wouldn't have been super large, only around 5 kilograms or maybe 12 pounds. They weren't massive animals, at least early on. It also showed some evidence of being non-on, meaning potentially something like Simolestes could have been actually a predator of the early terror birds. And fortunate for it, but really interesting to find that their fossil record does indeed go back to the Eocene in South America. There was also a look at the legs of the Unalagians, and specifically Boiteraptor. This was a group of fairly lightly built dromaeosaur raptor dinosaurs that lived in South America. This study was able to look at some of the muscles that would have connected to the very traditional and characteristic sickle claw of the dromaeosaurs. What they found is it didn't quite attach in the exact same places as we see in other dromaeosaurs, so potentially the Unalagians, while being very similar, were still doing something a little bit different, and that'll take more study to really find out, because unfortunately a lot of these animals are very partial. Lots of dinosaurs evolved to lose their teeth, but this paper tried to see if there was any connection between developing a beak and losing teeth. And what they found is sometimes, especially with birds, we very classically think of them as having a beak and not teeth, but there were some that had both earlier in their evolution. So the question is, is it a foregone conclusion? Once they evolved the beak, were they destined to lose teeth? The answer seems like it's a no. And that's because you have things like beaks on both things like hadrosaurs and the ceratopsians, and they still had teeth near the back of their mouth. So it seems like no, birds weren't just destined to lose teeth once they evolved a beak and potentially they could have survived to modern day and still had teeth if those groups did better, but just the ones that lost their teeth ended up succeeding after the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. There's also a study on Confucius Ornus to see if it is actually sexually dimorphic. There's a few suggestions that it could have been, in particular certain specimens looking different but otherwise having very similar morphology. This paper essentially looked at those specimens and went, okay, is there anything else that looks similar but actually isn't? And what they were able to find is, yeah, there's a little bit more robustness in certain specimens. While Confucius Ornus isn't directly related to modern birds, it is really good evidence for this kind of dimorphism being really common in birds. And by very common, I mean going all the way back to their origins. There was also a paper testing how feathers may have evolved and what they may have evolved for. And it did this by using the flushing idea. Essentially, certain birds will use their feathers to flush out prey. They scare prey like grasshoppers or other insects and are then able to catch and eat that. They did this by making a model of the dinosaur Caudipteryx and having that model drive through the grass. It's essentially a robot. From this, they were able to go, yeah, sure, the feathers do help scare some more of these insects. The problem is Caudipteryx may not have eaten insects. It's hard to know for sure. My main issue with this is there's other ways they could have tested this. For example, you could have just had a roadrunner somewhere set up a controlled environment where there's a certain number of grasshoppers and let it go forage through there, see how much the flushing actually changes. And by that I mean you can trim bird wings pretty easily without harming the bird. So let it go and see how well it does and then trim the wings and let it go and see how it does. It's not the hardest part of it in the world, but I just don't see the point of building a robot to test this. Eonephron infernalis is a new cagnathid oviraptorin coming from the Hellcrete formation. And this is interesting because it's not super complete, but we know of at least one specimen that's smaller that's gone unnamed, and another one, Anzu, which is actually larger. So it really helps to show that there is this very diverse oviraptorin fauna in North America during the very latest part of the Cretaceous. And finally, staying in the Hell Creek Formation, last year there was a paper that talked about, oh, T-Rex could have been as smart as a baboon. This paper was done by a lot of paleontologists that goes, yeah, we're going to simmer down some of those expectations. And they did a ton of stuff. They'd used a lot of different methods to try and come to a very quantitative answer of how smart could Tyrannosaurus rex have been. What they found is probably as smart as most dinosaurs. And potentially even crocodilians, however, some people still debate how smart crocodilians are. I think their most important graph is this one. And that's because this graph is able to actually show you that, yeah, sure, maybe Tyrannosaurus rex would line up more with birds as far as its intelligence, however, it's still just slightly below that in between ornithopods and the birds. What this suggests is potentially that Tyrannosaurus rex, sure, was more intelligent than other animals, but also if you just scale it with body size and the neuron density that they found in this paper, it was probably as smart as most reptiles. 
And finally, papers we did entirely separate videos on. First, one that was looking at Nanotyrannus and is Nanotyrannus its entirely own species and not just juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex? This paper says yes. There is also potentially a new Tyrannosaurus species, specifically Tyrannosaurus macriensis, which Really interesting, it does have some differences in the dentary, and I remember this being talked about at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. And while it is a partial fossil, I could totally see it being a separate species. It's just a matter of actually understanding if it is and hopefully getting better fossils, because it's really partial. And then finally, there was a paper that suggested Megalodon could have been even larger than we suggested. And this goes into a lot of different details, and there's potentially some issues with it because the fossil that they found isn't super complete, and there's a lot of different estimates floating around and different methods being used, and the comparisons they used may not have been perfect, but for now at least Megalodon may have been even larger. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I really love the support that we're getting on these videos. I think they are a wonderful service for the paleo community. If you want to support the channel, feel free to check out our Patreon. It's really nice to be able to have that kind of extra support when we're doing large projects like this every month. So really love that kind of support too. With all that in mind though, be safe, take care, don't go extinct.